Hello and welcome to The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, an exhibition of figuration by black artists in London, the centenary of the first Surrealist Manifesto, and a mural by the Native American artist Tonita Peña. As the exhibition The Time Is Always Now, featuring 22 artists from the African diaspora whose work takes the black figure as its starting point, opens at the National Portrait Gallery in London, I explore the show with its curator Echo Eschen. 2024 marks the centenary of the first Surrealist Manifesto by André Breton, and the first of a series of exhibitions focusing on the movement this year opened at the Royal Museums of Fine Arts of Belgium in Brussels this week, before travelling to the Centre Pompidou in Paris later in the year, and Hamburg, Madrid and Philadelphia next year. But what did that manifesto contain and how did it influence the course of the movement? Alice Mann, a surrealism specialist and professor of modern contemporary art at the University of Cambridge, tells us more. And this episode's work of the week is Eagle Dance from 1934 by Tonita Peña, one of the leading Native American Pueblo artists of the 20th century. It features in a new exhibition, Native American Art of the 20th Century, the William P. Healy Collection at the St. Louis Art Museum in the US. And Alexander Brian Ma, the Associate Curator of Native American Art at the museum, joins me to discuss the painting. It's your last chance to buy the art newspapers magazine The Year Ahead 2024, an authoritative guide to the world's must-see art exhibitions and museum openings. You can buy the magazine at theartnewspaper.com until the 1st of March for just £9.99 or $13.69. Do also subscribe to this podcast and to our sister podcast, A Brush With, the latest episode of which is an interview with the Indian artist Nalini Malani, wherever you're listening. Please also leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Now, this week, the National Portrait Gallery in London opened a new exhibition dedicated to figuration by artists from the African diaspora. Called The Time Is Always Now, Artists Reframe the Black Figure, it includes 22 artists, mostly based in the US and the UK, and will tour later in the year to The Box in Plymouth, in Britain, and the Philadelphia Museum of Art. I went to the MPG to explore the show and pick out some of the highlights with its curator, Echo Eschen. Echo, in your catalogue essay, there's a really intriguing comment that you make that while this is a cause for celebration to a certain extent, that we have 22 artists and many of them are extremely prominent, that there's no room for triumphalism. And I think that was really important because you set it in context of a Time magazine article and front cover and so on, a big shebang in time. Why no triumphalism? I'm very uncomfortable with the idea of celebration for its own sake. I'm very invested, by contrast, in recognition. I want to take seriously artists for what they do, for the space they create, for the questions they ask, for the invitation towards inquiry that they offer. I'm less interested in backslapping, (laughs) hubris, and all of those things. And so the title of the show... The premise of the show, it begins with a recognition of this extraordinary flourishing that I would suggest we're in, Mm. in terms of black figurative practice. But it doesn't stop there. That's our start point. That's not our finish point. Yeah, because the complex conditions that have prompted a lot of the kind of inquiries that are around us now continue to exist and get worse in certain parts of the world, right? Exactly, exactly. Look, basically, amongst a number of other things, the show explores black presence, We think about that contextually. Black presence in the Western world, it begins in trauma, begins in forced transportation, but even into the present day, there are many different ways where black presence is also a trigger for hostility, is also regarded in some form or other as illegitimate in all sorts of different ways, is also comes with its legacies of contemporary violence, all sorts of things. So that's some of the ground that we walk on. And that's why less celebration, but I'm really appreciative and constantly moved by the work of these artists because they allow any of us looking at this work to think with real depth and nuance about the condition of black being, about presence as a sight of possibility as well as a site of remembering and looking and gathering. 
Right. In one section, you use the word precarity and wonder as a kind of duality yeah. of, of that experience, if you like. Yeah. And, and that's very present in the show, isn't it? I mean, we're standing opposite a, a Michael Armitage painting yeah. right now, which directly channels Titian on the one hand. It's a grand act of painting. In a way, it's kind of extraordinarily celebratory of the reference points that Michael is drawing upon, but it's also representing a kind of turbulent moment that he experienced in Africa, right? Yeah. So, so there's, the, there's duality and wonder and precarity all the way through this exhibition. Yeah. I mean, I would say there can't not be. The show's structured around three themes, and one of those themes is double consciousness, Double consciousness is a well-known term coined by W.E.B. Du Bois, the great philosopher of race. He coined this at the end of the 19th century when he talked of what he called the peculiar sensation of living as a black person, both physically within white society, but psychologically outside that society. And it's that kind of complexity, precarity and wonder. So the wonder of black being, the wonder of creating life, creating society, creating connection, creating empathy within conditions that have their fraughtness to them, within conditions that have potential for violence, discomfort, antagonism, solely because someone decides the colour of your skin is not accurate, is not legitimate, for a place or for a time. So all of these conditions are in play at the same time. And I think so many of these artists say, yeah, we're looking at Michael Armitage, but also in this same room, we have Jennifer Packer, have Noah Davis, Wangechi Mutu, and just through there, Kerry James Marshall. All of these artists are so accomplished at being able to hold more than one position at the same time, at being able to speak of fraughtness, but also speak of wonder, also speak of possibility. And... It's been a really fascinating experience putting the show together because I find myself on a personal level constantly moved by the work. Right, I'm sure, absolutely. And, and, and one of the things that you're emphasising is this shift, if you like, from the objectivity of looking at the black figure yeah. to the subjectivity of seeing through black artists' eyes. Yeah. And, and I think this space is one of the rooms in the show that convinces you of that spectacularly, if you like. Because, as you say, you've got Jennifer Packer and these extraordinary, almost diaphanous sort of fields of paint and then very high definition, if you like, focus on certain aspects of bodies and so on. You've got Noah Davis, similarly, incredibly lyrical. You've got Michael, as we've already said, and then Wangechi. This sense of a kind of lyrical approach to painting, but with very specific social or political aspects sort of explored and amplified, if you like. I mean, look, Ben, you put it really, really well. Yes, it's absolutely that. Again, this capacity of these artists, yeah, to hold position to think about black being as a multifarious position. I would suggest the proposition that so many of these artists offer or are positing is that to exist and walk through the world as a person of color, as a black person, is to always be in a process of self-creation, self-imagining, and it always to be involved in an articulation of self because the social context for that, the historical context, is one of denial, is one of resistance to black presence. The answer in these artworks is to assert presence, but to do so through a claiming of beauty and insistence and an invocation that begins in nuance, that begins in complexity, that has depth all the way through it and you see that in all these different works they're very different works but they have a depth to them that uh, is breathtaking let's go and look at the kerry james marshall yeah. because it seems to me he's a kind of emblematic figure in many ways for this exhibition you know a landmark painter of the figure who had this almost epiphany Yes, you know, around 1980, where he was trying to figure out what to do, yes, and, and, and then found a way to do it through figuration, which at the time in 1980 we have to remember was a difficult thing to do. Actually, with, deeply as, as an unfashionable, artist. deeply unfashionable. But Kerry James Marshall, he reads Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. He has a revelation through this, as you say. He starts to think about the double gaze. He starts to think about double consciousness. He starts to think about being hyper visible and being unseen as a black figure and he begins to make these paintings with these exaggerated and deep black skin tones 
these works that seem acutely and sometimes painfully conscious of how they're seen. Interestingly, Kerry James Marshall also talks about his use of these deep black skin tones as an invitation to reflect and explore blackness as a site of possibility. So while Du Bois always talked about double consciousness as a kind of burden, as a pain, in fact, for Kerry James Marshall, it becomes a root way into thinking about how blackness itself and this consideration of being seen and being looked at can then lead to another form of looking, another form of articulation, which is an invitation to think about blackness as a site of depth, as a site of complexity, of multitudes of being and perspective and position, an insistence on blackness as wonder. And one of the ways that he does that, as you say, is to the use of black paint. Yeah. And there's this really lovely thing that happens all the way through the show, actually. You've got Kerry doing it here, yeah. really exploring it in such an interesting way. Then you've got Amy Sherrill using Grizzai for black skin. And then you've got Toyin Ojutola, who's using charcoal and yeah. with these extraordinary little flecks of white chalk through the skin. The idea of black as a colour is actually being proved incredibly useful to black artists. Yeah, right? well, absolutely that, yes. And what they're doing, I think, I would say they're doing a couple of things. One is they are investigating blackness as a colour, as a palette of possibility, but also, too, they're also looking sceptically at the idea of race as a fixed proposition, I would suggest that they are working from an awareness that race itself is nothing more than an idea. Race isn't a scientific reality. There's no physical or genetic difference between people of different colours other than their skin tone. And so they're thinking conceptually about, well, OK, how do you depict blackness then? You can't do this through realism because in which world is this real? Right. If race is a concept, then in fact, that actually begins to free us up to think conceptually about how we depict rather than simply attempt to offer a kind of naturalistic version of events. Doesn't Ellison actually even say that you can't treat it as real because the black experience is often so surreal? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, look, Invisible Man is almost like an ur text for right. all of these things, you know. It's one of the first works that looks at blackness as an existential position, that thinks about this as a site of absolute ongoing contradiction, always with complexity. And these artists, I mean, we're still looking at Carrie James Marshall. The astonishing thing about each painting will always continue to give and give and give. So we begin with blackness as a proposition, but then we think about how blackness has been depicted within Western art history. And Kerry James Marshall, this is a subject yeah. for him. He thinks about absence, he thinks about erasure, he thinks about misrepresentation of the black figure all this way through. So two of our paintings here, this painting, Untitled Painter from 2009, this figure at the forefront of the painting, painting a colour by numbers version of themselves in the background. Currently, there's no black in the background version of themselves. They're having to create themselves. They're having to imagine themselves anew on their terms. This is one of the things that, this is his work. Yeah, you really see that engagement that Kerry James Marshall has with the history of paint because it comes from a point of criticism on the one hand but yeah. also a point of reverence on yeah. the other he loves painting right? yeah there's this gorgeous portrait it's called portrait of a curator in memory of beryl wright and you can see he's engaging with tropes there's a yeah. there's a tulip in a glass on yeah. the table she's holding glasses so that you get to see him use his virtuosity yeah. and so on so but there's also there's also an african mask yeah. In the corner of there, so, you know, now we're the modernists, now we're with Picasso, all of these things. But then the role of the curator as a figure of elegance, as a figure of refinement in there. Mm. And this notion of how do we pass time? How do we structure and think and look back at how we have depicted or thought about both art history and the position of the black figure within all of that? All of this is wrapped up in here. So yeah, it's a show of black artists exploring the black figure but all of these artists are also they work within the western canon they work within the western tradition it's Kerry James Marshall's point simply that they are also heirs to this history they also can speak back to that history they can point out its deficiencies and its absences they have a legitimate right to do that because this is the work 
of our world. Well, let's go and look at Barbara Walker's work now, because that deals with that sort of absence and presence very powerfully, doesn't it? So we're now surrounded by two bodies of work, actually, Mm -hmm. by Barbara Walker, a British artist. And the wonderful thing about these is she's dealing with the presence of black figures in historic painting, but their marginalisation. And I know that you quote Bell Hooks in in the essay, and she talks very interestingly about how the margins can actually be a productive space. Yes, absolutely that. Yeah, so Bell Hooks writes about how the space in the margins, it can be a productive space, it can be a generative space, it can be a space where people who have been marginalised can hold ground, can occupy ground, and can thrive from there. We see something of that in Barbara Walker's work. So she takes paintings from the Renaissance period and afterwards, paintings which include a black figure, but very often these figures are on the margins of a painting. They're servants. They have this subjugated role in a work. Barbara Walker's technique, famously, she makes, what would you say, invisible? I mean, they're sort of visible. Yeah. She turns the the white figures into outlines, into sort embossed, of embossed figures. Aren't yes. they? Yeah, so they're sort of, yeah, they're sort of almost ghostly yeah. images of what was, we think, possibly for the painter, the sort of main action. And she makes that ghostly, yeah. if you like. Yeah, and then the one figure that is in focus is the black figure that's often at the edges of the picture, but we now see them just rendered just in beautiful, delicate graphite mm. pencil She turns these from the marginal figures into the figures of agency, into the figures at the centre of the work. If not literally at the centre, but certainly our eyes turn to them. Our eyes turn to them as living figures, as beings who have been present, but perhaps have not been recognised as fully alive. Absolutely. Even. And that even included the kind of art historical discourse around these yeah. works. I mean, the, the classic example, of course, is Manet's Olympia, yeah. where people are endlessly going on about the figure lying on the bed, but there yeah. is a, a black figure in that painting that was almost ignored in art history until very recent. Until very recently, the black woman in that painting, she's actually a central figure yeah. in that, but historically had gone overlooked. No one knew her name, but when we look closer... There's a whole story, there's a whole life Mm. around that figure. So Barbara Walker's work does something similar, which is to say, let's look at what is unseen but present in some of these works. And it's really fascinating because the works that we've been talking about so far are the Vanishing Point series, which is this embossing and then a single figure isolated in graphite. In other works called Marking the Moment, she actually draws the entire picture. Yeah. But then in this rather sort of interesting idea of denial or veiling, she then isolates the black figure by cutting out from a kind of sheet of mylar. So we see a kind of, again, a kind of ghostly trace of the full picture, but a high focus spotlight on the black figure. Yeah, I mean, it it is almost as if there's a spotlight in that figure. It's a really, really great technique because it has visual pleasure, but then sort of opacity and resistance to it. You can't see everything, but the thing you can see is this black figure. So you see them in their aliveness, but then you also recognise exactly the position that they've been put in. Mm. So these are servants or possibly enslaved people. So very often they're serving someone else. I mean, this work in particular, Mark in the Moment 11, there's an elegant lady in finery and dress. She's reaching out for some fruit that a black servant, a black boy... Is holding out for her, he's holding out a sort of vessel of fruit. She's not looking at him, she's not looking at the fruit. This is supposed to be an image of opulence, elegance and power. But because Barbara Walker is focused on that black figure, we see these power relationships and we see the cost of these power relationships. We see the experience of being subjugated, of being possibly enslaved. We see what it feels like to be marginalised, to be othered. And we also see, don't we, that idea that the painter of the original work made a choice. Yes, exactly that. You know, paintings aren't accidental, by and large. Anyway, certainly not this form of portraiture. And so we can see how that black figure is shoved to the side, to the back, is considered so unimportant that the central figure does not regard them, does not see them in that work. And even in terms of the original painter of this work, that figure was regarded as something superfluous, as another accessory in the work. So, yeah, there's an act of reclaiming 
here, an insistence that actually let's shift our gaze. That's what's going on in the work. Even though the idea of the persistence of history as this section of the show yeah. is called runs through the show to an extent you can't yeah. deny history yeah. but you end the show with a kind of section called our aliveness a very big section actually i wanted to talk about Njedeka akanyidi crosby's work because on the one hand this would seem like one of the most celebratory images of the show and yet in having the images of collaged newspaper images and found images generally embodied in the kind of structure of the painting. There's an element of critique too, right? So it's, it's a self-portrait, but there's a lot more going on than that. Uh, it's a self-portrait of Indijeka. She's carrying a small child in her arms. First and say it's a really beautiful painting. But yes, it's not about her in solitary. It's not about her in isolation. It's not per se just a celebration of the figure. Like you say, kind of transferred and printed into the texture of the work are all these found fragments of images, really of kind of Nigerian popular culture and life. And they're taken just from print media in general. So we see a central figure, but we also see a whole set of histories and a whole set of narratives in play. We also see not just this figure, we see a society, we see aspects of community, we see gathering, yes, but we also see just complexity within that society. In the context of this exhibition, let's say this, it's an invitation to think about black being already as a site of complexity, already as a site of historical depth and breadth simultaneously. Absolutely. And, and then opposite them, you have these three wonderful works by Hervin Anderson. And again, you, that complexity. But one of the amazing things for me about Hervin is he strips out so much. Yeah. And yet the work gets more complex through the stripping out, if you like, if you know what I mean. Hervin Anderson is an amazing, amazing painter. We look at these two barbershop works. You know, he's been making barbershop works probably for about two decades or so, roughly. He's a painter who will always keep looking and keep looking at his work. I went to a studio a while ago and has dozens of photographs up on the wall. For each single painting, he will look and think about how he's refracting his gaze, how he's both complicating his gaze, but also trying to get to a more simple position. So the barbershop works are almost minimal in their construction. Mm. But again, they speak of depths, they speak of multitudes. And each work offers a different position, a different perspective on arguably the same experience, but how can it be the same experience? He is lifting up the barbershop as a site of gathering, as a site really that speaks of real complex, generational arrival, gathering, fraughtness in fact, in terms of the history of immigration to Britain. All of this is wrapped up and encapsulated in the barbershop. So one painting can't do enough of that. Two paintings can't. He keeps painting these works because there's yet more to say about the apparently simple nature of being and gathering and holding space. Right. And one of the curious aspects of that process is there's a sort of gorgeousness about the way he yeah. uses paint. And I wanted to, to look at Chris Ophelia in the context of gorgeousness and light and yeah. colour and so on, because he's talked about that as almost like a strategy to yes. lure the yeah. viewer in, hasn't he? Yeah, that's very much the case. I mean... Chris Feely, he's a master of colour, he's a master of form, he's a master of line. Mm. This painting, Christmas Eve, Duane's Dance, it's based on a, a photograph. By yeah, Malik it's Malik, Malik Sidibe, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is a photograph also called Christmas Eve. The original photograph was taken in post-independence Mali. It's a photograph of celebration in terms of the post-independence era in that country. Chris takes that image and goes yet further with it. So just an amazing use of colour in here, the orange base to this, this kind of purple effect on one side, yellow on the other, but it's also a work of real intimacy and romance as well. This couple dancing together, their foreheads meeting against a starry backdrop. So it's a kind of beautiful painting, it's a romantic painting, but again also, the interesting thing again is that it speaks of hybrid histories as well. So this isn't a work that comes out of nowhere. Mm. Chris was interviewed in The New Yorker some years ago. The portrait of Chris that's used in that piece is a photograph by Malik Sidibe. It was a really great forming of a circle where he wanted to be photographed by one of those oh, nice. great portraitists yeah. because you can see the inspiration that he draws from that work in this painting. One last thing to say about this painting, it's also enormous. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's really large, but it has an intimacy to it. 
at the same time as that. Absolutely. And that enormousness actually is echoed in both Denzel Forrester's painting, which hangs alongside it, which is one of his great sort of dance hall sound system paintings, and also in Toya Nojutella's amazing series of works which really pick up on that grand manner portraiture. You're talking about art history in relation to Kerry James Marshall. This is absolutely grappling with that kind of grand manner history. Yeah, completely that. So this is part of a series where she imagines an aristocratic Nigerian family who are utterly at ease in their wealth, in their elegance, in their lineage. So yes, these set of paintings are about leisure. They're about power. They're about pleasure. They're fictional, but what a fiction. What a kind of, <laughs> what a kind of imaginable. So much so that we have three of them here. We're looking at one central figure who's lounging in a red leather chair. There's a Carrie James Marshall painting on the wall in the work. So they are utterly at home within a conversation about presence, power, wealth, art, history. But also then, again, an assertion that we can have a different narrative in play here. That all of this power, all this Western power, doesn't have to reside exclusively in the hands of some people. This is another version of that power, beautifully evoked and dreamt into being. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Ben. The time is always now. Artists Reframe the Black Figure is at the National Portrait Gallery in London until the 19th of May. It then travels to the Box in Plymouth in the UK from the 29th of June to the 29th of September and then to the Philadelphia Museum of Art from the 9th of November to the 9th of February next year. Coming up, a deep dive into the first Surrealist Manifesto on its centenary and a mural painting by Tonita Peña. That's after this week's News Bulletin. A previously unknown composition by Paul Cézanne has been discovered as part of the renovations to his childhood home, the Bastille du Jardin de Buffon in Aix-en-Provence in France. The discovery was made in August last year in the Grand Salon, the main living area in the house. Until that point, only nine paintings have been identified in this space, all of them painted directly onto the walls between 1859 and 1869. They were transferred to canvases and are now in museums, from the Musée d'Orsay in Paris to the Nakata Museum in Onomichi in Japan. Pieces of the unknown composition with ship's masts and a sky stretching across the upper part of the wall were found under layers of wallpaper and plaster. The discovery puts into question the order in which the panels in the Grand Salon are believed to have been painted. Arts organisations in Birmingham, UK, are under threat following the announcement by the City Council that it plans to make £300 million worth of cuts to services over the next two years. Grants to regularly funded arts organisations in the city will be cut by 50% this year and 100% in the next financial year. Among the institutions affected is the Icon Gallery, a key contemporary art space. Ian Hyde, the Chief Executive Officer of Icon, said that the cuts will impact how the gallery serves the city's communities and its audiences. Icon is 60 years old this year and has a long history of showing new artistic talent and rediscovering overlooked artists. Hyde said that the gallery is determined to stay open and free for everyone but pointed out that Icon currently receives just over £19,000 per year from the council, a figure that's fallen from more than 300000 in 2012. The council effectively declared itself bankrupt last year following years of austerity since the current Conservative government took power in 2010, a £760 million equal pay claim liability and a huge overspend on an IT system. The British Museum has been accused of silencing its critics on social media. The museum switched off comments on one of its Instagram posts after the Chilean social media influencer Mike Milfort encouraged his followers to join him in calling for the return of Moai statues to the island of Rapa Nui, called Easter Island by its European visitors. The museum admitted comments were deactivated on just one post and said that debate has to be balanced against safeguarding considerations. Meanwhile, the museum is suffering a series of leaks from old roofs. The necessitating emergency repairs above several galleries. In a planning application to its local council last year, the museum stated that urgent work is required to mitigate water ingress, which is putting the integrity of the building and the collection at risk of significant damage. Progress on its long-awaited master plan has slowed as a result of the recent scandal over the theft of 2,000 Greek and Roman artefacts. To read these stories and much more, visit the website or the app. 
Now, this year marks the centenary of the first manifesto of surrealism written by the group's leader, André Breton. As a result, there's a burst of shows and publications across the world this year, including the exhibition Imagine 100 Years of International Surrealism, which opened this week at the Royal Museums of Fine Arts of Belgium in Brussels, and will travel to the Centre Pompidou in Paris later this year, and then to Madrid, Hamburg, and eventually Philadelphia, with an emphasis on different aspects of surrealism at each venue. But what was in that first document that framed the movement and what were its immediate and long-term effects. Alice Mann is Professor of Modern and Contemporary Art at the University of Cambridge, and I spoke to her about the First Manifesto. Alice, you've actually made a contribution to the Paris version of this show in the form of a catalogue essay. One of the interesting things about this big 100th anniversary show is that it's shape-shifting. In Belgium, for instance, they're focusing on the connection between serialism and symbolism. That seems a very surrealist idea that it can shape shift wherever it travels in the world. Yes, it's true that exhibition is taking a kind of global reach, ending up in the United States and next stop, as you say, in the Pompidou in Paris. I think it's trying to stay true to certain aspects of surrealism and the manifesto idea that surrealism isn't a style. The fact that Breton kept emphasising that it was a philosophy. So every initiation of the exhibition, trying to map an aspect of 100 years, therefore can delve into different avenues. Uh, in the case of the Pompidou and what I was writing about, it was it was the erotic and how that changed across many decades. But I think the other thing is that there's a consciousness on the part of curators and museums to really genuinely do a global reach so that it's not Eurocentric, it's not Paracentric. It's not focused on men alone. So one of the other really important things that's, that's fabulous and exciting is that finally it really is mapping the full collective and the fact that that really did challenge boundaries, national as well as artistic. So its roots can go back to symbolism. But as we know, it'll go all the way to the legacies of surrealism with things like Afro surrealism, too. Yeah, absolutely. And I noticed in the Belgian catalogue, for instance, there's works by Jackson Pollock and Alexander Calder and so on. And so they, they chart surrealism's legacies going on into other movements and so on. But also really important, isn't it, that they establish that not only did surrealism continue for a very long period, but its legacies continue right up to now. Yes, I think there's the idea that it's not a movement, it's not an ism. So it's curious, though, because there's always going to be a little bit of a territorial battle because those of us who work in surrealism or curate surrealism are very keen to emphasise it's everywhere. So, yes, it influenced abstract expressionism, but it was a give and take. And ditto for Caribbean surrealism. You know, there are exhibitions this year documenting surrealism in Japan. Surrealism and the African diaspora, you know, and Lee Miller's exhibitions, again, photography as opposed to her sort of straight surrealist work. So there's sort of variations on it. I think what we're doing is trying to sort of mess the chronology, the, the traditional canonical narrative, and just show these as kind of something a bit more uh, rhizomatic in terms of influences. And that's for the better, because the one thing that probably does link the various artists as I say, in the various generations and decades, would be this sense that it was a philosophical way of looking at the world. It involved the subconscious or the unconscious, depending on whether you're being Freudian or Jungian. And that was the key to what was so liberating for everybody. There wasn't one style, one medium, etc. And how much of that is inherent in the first manifesto, which is the cause for the anniversary? Well, I think the first manifesto is really useful as a kind of recipe for how to be surrealist rather than how to paint surrealist. So what's nice about it is André Bertrand, on behalf of his avant-garde group, lifts ideas out of data, which of course is very anti-psychoanalysis and Freud. It was more anarchic. And it kind of gives you a certain element of ingredients for your own recipes then. So he does emphasise things like it's about the imagination, yes, as your key yeah. starting and end. But there isn't one sense of the imagination so much as that it has to be given full free reign. He keeps using that expression of free reign. And at the same time, as I say, he kind of emphasises everything it's not. So you know it's not about logic. You know it's not about science, rationality. He's talking about the child and wanting to get back there. But he's still trying to emphasise that the kind of inherent contradiction of surrealism is that if he told you what it was, you wouldn't be free to do what you want with it. 
Yeah, and he's very attached to that idea of freedom, isn't he? He mentions about how that is the concept that matters most to him. It's full of great lines. That's absolutely true about this first manifesto. There's so many great lines in it. You're right. He has sort of these catch-all phrases like, you know, the mere word freedom is the one that still inspires me. So he's sort of speaking like a poet or an advocate on the one hand. And then there are other bits of humour or when he gives you an example of a poem which is made as a collage poem. So he's cut out headings from contemporary newspapers. So it's a kind of exquisite corpse poem. So he cuts out different limbs, puts them together, much like you do now with fridge magnets, no? Yeah. So there's that sort of sense that there's a playfulness. It's in the everyday. But as I say, the freedom means that it can't be prescriptive for artists, even though there's political agendas too. So you have to allow people interpret the world through surrealist eyes in whatever way they see fit. The wonderful thing about it too, though, is that he also does give a hard and fast definition, doesn't he? He says, I'm defining it once and for all. And he says, here it is. I'm going to read it out from the manifesto. Surrealism, noun, psychic automatism in its pure state by which one proposes to express verbally by means of the written word or in any other manner, the actual functioning of thought, dictated by thought in the absence of any control exercised by reason, exempt from any aesthetic or moral concern. What a brilliantly succinct definition mm -hmm. and what a wonderful element within, as you say, so much kind of freedom and, and playfulness in the rest of the manifesto, if you like. Well, it's also, I think it's a, it's a kind of a dense one. It, it does follow with them saying it's philosophy too. So that's the noun of it. So he distinguishes it then. So that sounds like something you could almost purchase. But let's remember philosophy is one of those slippery fields. But within those terms, pure psychic automatism, they're really huge, dense concepts. And purity and the psyche are not usually bedfellows. So it's sort of a contradiction in terms. Then the idea of something being automatic. So you're not meant to premeditate. You're meant to unleash on the page, unleash on the canvas, somehow draw out your psyche, even though we're told not to do that. So it's it's a very utopian definition in that sense as kind of having such lofty ideas. And then if you're sort of getting ingrained in that, he's also linking it to philosophy. And then, as I say, he tends to do dot, dot, dot. The typescript is very interesting like that, how he designs yeah. it and then says, so let's see, what do you do if you're bored by people? What if you want to try a novel? What about poetry? Yeah. And he makes it more playful. Yeah. It's very episodic, isn't it? There's different literary styles even within it. Yes, that's the word I should have used. Um, yes, <laughs> episodic, it's true. And I think a lot of it's in the ellipsis, it's in the, the bits in between. So there's that sense that there's a space there for your interpretation. But I always think with surrealists that manifestos, they're like James Joyce, they're there to be reread. You're never going to get it in the first sitting. And that's part of the idea of you engaging with the ideas and interpreting them. And you'll also note that it's a it's a pretty bookish manifesto because he cites many authors. So it's kind of trying to be poetic. And then you're hearing about sort of St. Thomas Aquinas, Apollinaire, Freud, Racine, Baudelaire. So this good schoolboy is coming through the pages too. It's very much the Third French Republic in terms of a canon coming through. Something that he wants realism to be as good as, but better. Right. You know, it's a kind of alternative countercultural group of fellow thinkers or surrealists before surrealism. But it also suggests that he's really hoping surrealism will have that kind of reach those heights too. So for 1924, it's terribly ambitious. Indeed it is. And, and, and there's that wonderful list, of course, where he cites those forebears. Swift is surrealist in malice, it begins. And that's great, isn't it? Again, the playfulness, the use of language. And it's, and it's an exercise, isn't it? A kind of creative exercise in the way of thinking through the past and how it influences the present in a way. That's true. And I think there's sort of two things about that. On the one hand, he's remapping history. So our an alternative canon, as you say, and it's also mapping a world. So you've got Swift, you've got, so it's not all Francophone, mm. but he's trying to say that somebody might sort of say, oh, I've read Baudelaire, I've read Swift, the Marquis de Sade is there too. But there's the idea that there's something innately surrealist in us. And I think that's where on the one hand, you've got the fine literature and the citations, but also this post-war sort of search for a childlike awakening. And it really does come out of a kind of time of trauma and war. And he does cite the child as having this sort of ability not to worry. He kind of says the child doesn't automatically worry. The world can be black and white for a child. They can imagine without thinking that something sounds crazy or irrational. So there's also that little element there that that's perhaps what draws us all to fiction and poetry and art. Something there that we can't quite pin down rationally. And as I say, this a sense that people need to be reawakened after the war in the mid-20s. At this stage, obviously, there had been sort of ripples of surrealism emerging pre the manifesto, 
particularly in Les Champs Magnétiques and in the journal Literature. You talked about that literary element. To what extent was it a literary movement at that stage? Because obviously artists are mentioned through this, but the dominant mm. theme is literature. Right. So to what extent mm. did Breton have in mind that it was rippling beyond literature into art and it would grow as a sort of idea and, as you see, no style, but a kind of a means of thinking about the world? Well, he does clarify that he'll allow for surrealism or encourages surrealism by any means possible. So he gives the example of literature, but he says by any means possible, I think is a reflection of that he's a writer. He's a novelist. His you know novel Nadja will be published four years later. And so his experiments are coming in poetry and novels and literature. We know from his other writings and and later manifestos, you know, the second and third manifesto, that he's increasingly courting artists, photographers, filmmakers. So where Dada was, I suppose, emphatically visual and performative, I think one of the things that Surrealism tried to immediately grasp was their status as a literary movement, a poetry movement from the get go in the 1920s, but then quickly try to see where it might go with that same exploration of chance in painting and in photography, as I say. So I think he's he's throwing out a sort of a dare to people who might read the manifesto and he's he's leaving enough gaps there, as I say, for people to play with. But in his list, you're right, it's mainly it is writers, yeah, but writers who often collaborated with artists. And we're very much centre of a visual culture. Absolutely. And, and then he names, it, there's sort of teasing names through the manifesto, just a few names here and there. Picasso, so much courted by mm. surrealism, mm. never officially a surrealist, I believe, but, no. but absolutely connected to it, illustrating journals and so on. They really wanted to get him, didn't they? And he's there all the way through. Yes, this. I mean, he did, he did do the cover of the Minotaur in the 1930s. Yeah. He was very supportive. And I think he acknowledges Picasso and Braque as the kind of the gods, the Cubist gods. Mm. And to be fair, in the 1920s, Picasso was enjoying a, a rebirth with his big monumental nudes on the beach and, and sort of he made a big shift away from, from Cubism. Yeah. And on American shores too, everybody was citing Picasso. So he was the sort of Oedipal challenge for the younger artists coming along, like André Breton and his friends. What he didn't know is that he was going to start finding a whole group of artists who came to Surrealism through Picasso, often visiting Picasso, who would say, you're a painter, you should go meet this guy, André Breton, and his friends, who were doing exciting things. And one of the other things about Breton is he was clever enough to curate groups of artists. He was very, very important in recognising the importance of artists curating themselves, having exhibitions, a manifesto, which is a piece of paper, publicity. And at the same time, he's issuing this manifesto. They're, the Surrealists are, are scattering in the streets of Paris or so, the myth goes sort of leaflets saying, if you love love, you love surrealism. So there was clever ways of grabbing the public imagination. And that's how young artists will start thinking, hang on, this could be something curious. You mentioned Freud earlier on, and he's in there. And it's important to state that, you know, Breton's fascination with Freud emerged from life experiences, right? He was uh, working in, in the war in a field where he was exposed to psychological theory and so on. So he, he knew about Freud, but obviously clearly spotted something in Freud that really was at the cornerstone of everything he, he then did in terms of surrealism. Yes, I think that's why he harnesses in the word psyche and psychic automatism, because that's resonating with conversations at the time. And of course, it's also resonating with the fact that the 1920s were dealing with shell shock, traumatized men. You know, hysteria was a female problem, according to the scholars. But I think that meant that, yes, he was as a medical student, experienced that at the front and saw that actually victims of World War I, as well as their families, were trying to work out how to deal with that trauma and the fact that it was repressed, returning. It wasn't just maimed bodies, but maimed minds, too. So that was in the air. Freud was being published in the 1920s in French from the German, and therefore people were discussing it. And you find a lot of these surrealists, too. I usually just sort of think of them as dropout students because they were medics, they were studying anthropology, they were studying philosophy. So they were partly because of their experience of war, they elected not to return to university. They really said something else had to be done. And so that's where the, the politics undermining this sort of poetic vision is really quite important too, because until people started imagining society differently and the work of art as being something that could help society differently, then war would only beget another war, which of course is what happened. When he, as you say, issues this dare to people, what happens? I mean, is this 
manifesto widely read? Do the artists that you say he's talking to pick it up and run with it? How closely do they adhere to it? And how much does he police that? Well, I think to be fair, and this is where the Breton archives in Paris are quite revealing because we know he was a a very thorough editor. So he was always making little notes, corrections. As I say, he was a curator orchestrator Mm. as well as a very well-read person recommending texts to people. Most surrealists who've been interviewed or who've done autobiographies of one form or the other tend to say that it was Andre Breton's ideas and some of the context in terms of that sense of freedom, that sense of not being prescriptive. So it's more they use a certain vocabulary, I'd say, or discourse that comes out of the manifesto. It's not that they all started collaging poems right. or took it as an orthodoxy. In fact, they were very adamant that anybody who sort of fallings out with the surrealists would say that was over. They didn't want Andre Breton having that much power. But I think that was give and take. By and large, you'll find that it is the vocabulary that emerges. Concepts of the marvellous come through that. And this is a kind of really quirky word that is used a lot because that's marvellous but actually for the surrealist that's a code for surrealism which is finding something enchanting in the everyday it's the same way as you know later he'll talk about convulsive beauty or mad love Mm. so they're terms that people begin to understand and they'll run with and I think that's very much with visual artists what they took from this manifesto was a sense of urgency a sense of the sort of poetic play with language, with tradition. So you find a lot of that sense of artists actually looking at the academy and subverting it, not just creating something brand new. And also the idea of collage, bizarre juxtaposition. So that comes across in this too, scientific, rational language, and then jump to something poetic. Then a sort of a reference to, as I say, sort of Dostoevsky in a footnote, mm. as if we're all meant to have read Crime and Punishment. And, you know, so there's a kind of knowingness and playfulness in the mix. I think that's the crux of why it intrigued. It is not that any artist started citing this manifesto verbatim. Now, let's talk about one of the key factors in your research, because you've got a book coming out later this year about Dorothea Tanning. You did the Tanning show at Tate Modern. You worked on the Leonor Feeney show at the Museum of Sex in New York and so on. There are no women, as far as I know, no female cultural figures mentioned in the manifesto. Yet, as we know, so many of these ideas were picked up and created some of the great art of the 20th century by women. What can we say about that? What's your view on Breton's attitude to women for a start, but also why it was that women weren't put off by the fact that there are none of their contemporaries mentioned in this <laughs> uh, manifesto and went ahead and, and explored it? Well, I think when the manifesto came out in 1924, it was mainly a group of literary bods of males, yes? Mm. And they had partners. Uh, Simone Kahn, who Breton's partner, was was in the mix as a poet. But it's mainly in the 1930s. It took about 10 years for aspiring writers and artists who were female to discover more manifestos, for them to be translated into other languages, English including, for people like Leonore Carrington to discover surrealism in 1936. But I think the network meant that gradually painters who were females were the first who were intrigued by it. And there was this huge opening for people to try and come up with styles which would actually translate a lot of this textual ideas into something visual on a canvas. I mentioned the word marvellous and Mm -hmm. one of the things André Breton says is that woman is the most marvellous problem in the world. And I think modern day contemporary readers sort of see that as a slight, as something which says, oh, they're they're problematic. And that's because Freud said women were problematic or a dark continent and something that couldn't be understood. But in fact, if you think of the word marvellous being used alongside woman, it means that actually she was, again, seen as a kind of a creature, a muse, but also somebody who might be more in tune with the senses, might be closer to children by virtue of being a, a mother or a family member and actually think more about how does a child look at the world? What do toys mean? What does play mean? And so actually, I think a lot of women started seeing aspects of surrealism which allow them to master their own image and also their sexuality because It's not written extensively here in this first manifesto, but the body does creep through the manifestos and ideas and just putting sort of the body and the sexual body and the body of the female centre stage of art and writings meant that women who were trying to find a, a language to discuss their own bodies and identity politics seized it. 
And, and actually talking about the child, they mentioned the, the idea of the child there and, and that consistent element th- through the manifesto. No artist probably explored that in greater depth than Tanning in some way. She has a way of imaging the experience of the childhood and how it relates to the adult psyche. Yeah. I can't think of an artist who does that better in the context of surrealism. Yes, she explores the child and, and the femme enfant, as we call it, the child woman, mm. but not as something sort of just Alice in Wonderland-like, not sort of passive or running after a rabbit so much as probably devouring the rabbit for dinner. But she kind of, so she's these quite voracious females, little girls. And it is a sort of Lolita type, that sense of someone on the brink of adulthood and having a a sexual curiosity and a sort of intellect in the mix. But I think what's really important is more that that's actually thinking about how we gradually remove imagination and freedom and daringness and humour from the child as we bring them into the civilised world of adulthood and the law of the father and all that. So the child knows no bounds. They can imagine anything. And there's that added element if that child happens to be female, because on entering puberty, they start being fashioned for the life of mother, wife, etc. And so that was very much the idea that could we re-educate or be bad mothers almost to the child as a way of actually instilling them with a much more revolutionary potential and knowing that they could actually dictate their own future. So I think that's very important that they often seize the child at that age, as I say, prepubescent before there's a notion of procreative role and allow them something more creative and courageous. And that's where the sort of proto-feminist element comes into surrealism. Yeah. Lastly, Alice, when I was reading the manifesto, it occurred to me that for all the limitations that we might have pointed to here, it strikes me that it still acts as a dare, doesn't it? If you're a person living in the 21st century, you can read this and some of it will prove incredibly inspiring. A lot of it will prove incredibly vexing and so on. But it's still a dare. It's still a cultural phenomenon which can prompt ideas, can prompt that very fecund imagination that Breton is urging in in the actual text. Yes, I think actually in these current political times, it resonates all the more powerfully. And I think the fact that he says that there's he's a belief in life and in, in what's most fragile in life, protecting what's most fragile in life, speaks to everyone and, as I say, does resonate. And he also notes that surrealism will change. So he notes it's adapt. it adapts to the sociopolitical circumstance. And I definitely think that's why younger contemporary artists are turning to surrealism, while we have sort of Afrofuturism, Afro-surrealism. It's not just discovering stories and surrealists that definitely take it way beyond the lifespan of André Beton, but also thinking about why contemporary artists and audiences are really finding that surrealism sort of dialogue between the imagination and the sense of politics and art mattering still speaks loudly. Alice, as ever, thank you very much. Thank you. Alice Mann is the co-editor of a new international journal of surrealism published by Minnesota University Press. In a tribute to the centenary, the theme of this autumn's edition is the manifesto. Alice's book, Dorothea Tanning, A Surrealist World, is published by Yale University Press in September. Imagine 100 Years of International Surrealism is at the Royal Museums of Fine Arts of Belgium in Brussels from the 21st of February to the 21st of July. It then travels to the Centre Pompidou in Paris from the 4th of September until the 13th of January next year. To the Fundación Mapfre in Madrid from the 4th of February to the 11th of May 2025, the Hamburger Kunsthalle in Hamburg in Germany from the 12th of June next year to the 12th of October, and then it ends its run at the Philadelphia Museum of Art in the US from autumn 2025 to spring 2026. And finally, it's time for the work of the week. On Friday, the St. Louis Art Museum opens an exhibition of modern Native American art with drawings, paintings and sculptures by 53 artists from 25 indigenous nations, all part of the William P. Healy collection, a transformative gift to the museum. Among them is Eagle Dance from 1934, a mural painted by Tonita Peña, who was born Qua A in the Kewa Pueblo in New Mexico in 1893. The exhibition is curated by Alexander Brian Marr, the associate Associate Curator of Native American Art at the St. Louis Art Museum, and I spoke to him about the work. Alex, we're going to talk about Tonita Peña. She's also known as Kwa A. Can you say something about her background? Where was she from? Where is she based when she becomes an artist? Absolutely. Yeah, Tonita Peña was born at San Ildefonso Pueblo in 1893. 
and grew up there until she was about 12 years old when she moved to Coche de Pueblo. So these are indigenous communities on the upper Rio Grande River in northern New Mexico, nearby Santa Fe, New Mexico. And that's really where she spent her entire life. And was there an art making culture that she entered into or is she a pioneer within that community in terms of making art? Because, of course, there are all sorts of traditions within indigenous communities, but she's making art in a format that is recognisable, if you like, for museum collectors and so on, as in works on paper. So tell us about that transition from traditional art making. Right. Absolutely. It's both. So as you indicated, there's an ancient history of Pueblo and art making that goes back thousands of years. You know, the ancient material most famously is associated with sites like Chaco Canyon and Mesa Verde, black and white pottery, and largely abstract motifs. But there's a whole range of Pueblo art forms. Textile arts are very sophisticated, painting on walls. And so this is really the context in which Tonita Pena was raised. Her aunt and uncle were famous potters, Martina Vigil and Florentino Montoya. And so what was happening right around the time that Tony de Pena was born in the late 19th century is the markets for Pueblo and ceramics were changing. So not just for use within the communities or exchange with other native groups, but because rail had arrived in the Southwest in 1880, following the U.S. annexation of the Southwest territories, there were now whole new buyers and markets, both in the Southwest, but also reachable on the East Coast and Midwest. So potters were undertaking a lot of transformation of their work, experimenting, making new forms. Peña worked with her aunt and uncle at Cochiti, but she also participated in some of the earliest experiments in Pueblo easel painting, works that were, as you mentioned, recognizable to diverse audiences, especially Americans living in the Midwest and East Coast as fine art. And so she was a student at a government school at her Pueblo of birth, San Ildefonso, starting in 1902, the superintendent of that school offered watercolors and paper to students and encouraged them to paint dances. And so Tonita Pena was part of that kind of origin story for Pueblo modernisms. It's not the only one, but it's a major source of this movement. And there was also a lot of activity happening between the Pueblo of San Ildefonso and the Museum of New Mexico around excavations on the Pajarito Plateau right by San Ildefonso of ancient villages. There was a lot of reproduction of ancient murals going on, as well as artists like Awatsire, a contemporary of Tunita Pena, selling work directly to travelers to Frijoles Canyon and the Pajarito Plateau. And also, of course, around the time that she was really becoming a notable figure as an artist, there was a tremendous pressure in terms of politics, because is it right the federal government was effectively taking action against the kind of dances that Tonita was representing in her work? Yes. The notion of Pueblo dances and the viability of Pueblo dances was a political flashpoint in the early 20th century. And the question about whether to allow Pueblo dances from the government's perspective created kind of new political alignments in the Southwest and provided the basis for a broad political movement which led to the Indian Reorganization Act, a piece of federal legislation that was a signature of the New Deal of Franklin uh, Roosevelt's administration in the in the 1930s. So there certainly were a number of people in New Mexico and across the country, white Americans, who sought to ban Pueblo dances. And at the same time, there was a counter movement to promote Pueblo dances. And that movement was closely tied in with the networks of support for Pueblo modernism around Santa Fe in the 1910s and 20s. That's really interesting. And of course, the Works Progress Administration is directly connected to this work that we're going to talk about, isn't it? Because this is a work she made for the WPA, and which was obviously a tremendous sort of nationwide art-making process. But tell us what her contribution to it was. 
So the first New Deal program for artists was the Public Works of Art project, starting in late 1933 and early 1934, which anticipated the Works Progress Administration. So really forward-looking use of federal funds in the Depression. There were a series of districts across the country, each administered locally, usually by a museum director. The district in the Southwest that included New Mexico was somewhat unusual because it also included a program for Native American artists. Right. There's quite a lot to say about Native American art and the New Deal. And in fact, there have been multiple books on this topic <laughs> <Right>. recently. <laughs> so, you know, just to kind of keep that succinct. In Santa Fe, in the winter of 1933 and 1934, there was a group of Pueblo artists who took up residence at the Santa Fe Indian School, also during a period when that school was opening a very formative studio program for their students. And so Peña lived there and created a number of murals along with students at the school. Right. And there's a marvellous photograph, actually, a Works Progress Administration photograph of her at work on this work that we're going to talk about with a ruler in hand and a paintbrush and a, and a palette next to her. What a marvellous thing to exist. It's just amazing because documentation of artist work and perspectives from this period is not very strong. Peña did write a series of letters to the Museum of New Mexico in 1920 when she began selling work to them. But other than that, we have very little primary source archival material from artists. So to be able to see the way that she worked with that ruler and the particular way that she arranged her palette and progressed on the pieces. There's quite a lot of information there. There really is, exactly. Now tell us about the painting, because it's, as you say, it's a mural. So in, in a way, this is quite an unusual thing to be talking about in terms of her wider practice, right? Because a lot of it is done on paper and therefore would be a lot smaller. Peña did create murals throughout her life. They're not very well documented, but you're absolutely right that the dominant mode of production for Pueblo watercolorist around Santa Fe in the 1920s was works on paper at a relatively small scale. We're talking not much more than two feet in either dimension. Right. And so what's interesting about the PWAP murals, the Public Works of Art Project murals from these Pueblo artists in 33 and 34, is that they essentially just enlarge the same types of paintings that they were creating on watercolor. So even though Peña was engaged with the long history of uh, Pueblo muralism, which is stylistically quite distinct, she chose to continue to work in the modernist idiom for this mural. Right. Now tell us what you mean by the modernist idiom, because I can look at this painting and I can say that there are clear sort of ideas of kind of reductive, a kind of certain spareness about the work, no interest in depicting the background as such. And therefore there is a very kind of modern feel about it. But is that the right way to interpret this idea of modernism within this work? I think the question of modernism for Native art is partly stylistic. It has a lot to do with materials as well. If we think about modernity as offering a radical break from the past, right. the engagement with easel painting is a critical juncture here, as well as the production of paintings for new markets and a kind of direct engagement with the institutions and vocabularies of fine art. It's not that there wasn't any native easel painting before, it just becomes systematized in the 1920s. And so we see by the end of the 20s, the emergence of some pretty strong conventions for the genre, which include lack of background and emphasis on figuration. There continued to be experimentation within this realm, but they were codified more or less as a movement and a style in conversation with modernism. And here she's depicting an eagle dance. Obviously, there were all sorts of different dances. Tell us about the eagle dance and what does she choose to emphasize in this particular image? So each public community has a cycle of 
dances. There are a whole range of dances for distinct purposes. The eagle dance is practiced at a number of Upper Rio Grande communities and was also a key part of Santa Fe Fiesta in the 1920s, cultural gathering that included quite a lot of performance. So what she's depicting here is the two eagle dancers. The dance is performed with two male dancers dressed as an eagle, or rather dressed to evoke an eagle. So there are six figures across this painting. The figures on either side flanking the group are a drummer at left and a singer at right. And in the middle, we have two men dressed as eagles with a cap of eagle down and a beak and then these wing-like capes. They're also wearing leather kilts and, and tail feathers and woven sashes. And then they are interspersed by two female dancers dressed in white cotton mantas and bearing white face paint. Right. And while Tonita Peña is trying to establish a kind of certain symmetricality between the four figures at the centre of the image, it's clear that they are individual. It's not a type she is depicting here. She is depicting individual people, it seems to me, because particularly in the two male eagle dancers, you can very clearly identify in their profiles that they are different people. Absolutely. And there are slight differences in gesture and pose. And this is a really critical piece of Pueblo ceremonial dance, which is essentially a form of communal prayer. Right. So dress is, is a very important part of Pueblo dance. There's a lot of repetition of movement and similarity between the outward appearance of figures, but each person performs it kind of in their own body, right? And so there's a wonderful tension between the individual identities of each dancer and the collective performance in a Pueblo dance. Right. And I think that Peña does that very well, conveys that dynamic sense very well in this painting and other paintings with multi-figures. Absolutely. And, and you mentioned the dress and capturing of materials and so on. That's really strong in the work, isn't it? This idea of pattern, of material, of texture and so on. She's got an extraordinary ability to capture not just the kind of feel of the dance, but the kind of experience of the people performing the dance, it seems to me. Absolutely. She was a dancer. She participated oh. in the ceremonial life of Cocha de Pueblo, where she moved when she was 12 and then raised her family. Her representations are informed deeply by her own lived experience with Pueblo dance and her own understanding of the art and material culture of the Pueblos. And this is something that she understood was appealing to her audience in the 1920s. I mentioned those letters now archived in Santa Fe, and they include her own statements about her deep embodied knowledge of the full range of Pueblo art forms. Right. And lastly, what is Tonita's reputation globally, if you like, in terms of among artists in general, but also among communities that have followed her and so on? And, and you know, we are now seeing a wonderful burst of indigenous art on display, for instance, in the upcoming Venice Biennale. Is Tonita a kind of emblematic figure for US-based indigenous communities? This is a very interesting question to me because... Among the native art communities in the U.S., I think she's widely recognized as a pioneer. She was the sole woman in this first generation of Pueblo modernist painters and an inspiration to a number of women who followed, notably Pablita Velarde, a very active painter through the 20th century who met Tonita Pena in 1932 when Velarde was a student at the Santa Fe Indian School. Velarde also participated in the PWAP mural program. Pena's son, Joe Herrera, was a very interesting artist as well. In terms of what the recognition is beyond Native artists and scholars of Native art. I'm not sure. I'm very interested to know what it might be. She was included in the U.S. Pavilion in the 1932 Venice Biennale, along with a number of other Pueblo watercolorists. The scholarship on that exhibition indicates that it has not been very well remembered. Mm. And indeed, there has been this line that Native American artists have not shown at the U.S. Pavilion. Jeff Gibson certainly will be the first solo artist of indigenous Native American heritage to show at the 
pavilion. But there is this history that I worry may have been forgotten. And so engaging with the work of Tonita Pena and her contemporaries is vitally important as contemporary Native American art begins to receive the global recognition that it deserves. I think that audiences in the U.S. and Europe are familiar, if not closely familiar, with 19th century Native American art. That tends to be European collections go into the 18th century as well, but it's the historic material that has been displayed and reproduced the longest. It's wonderful to see contemporary Native art receive its due. But there is a kind of missing part of this story, which is the middle chapter, the 20th century, and modernism, how we moved from what we now see as historic art forms to contemporary. You know, the 20th century was a really complex period for Native artists and communities, a period of massive change, but also a period of invention, an invention geared towards cultural survival. So the fluorescence that we're seeing now would not have been possible without artists like Tony de Pena. Alex, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Native American art of the 20th century, the William P. Healy Collection, is at the St. Louis Art Museum in the US until the 14th of July. And that's it for this episode. You can find us on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Tan Audio, and on Facebook, Instagram, and Threads. The Week in Art is produced by Julia Mahalska, Alexander Morrison, and David Clack. And David's also the editor and sound designer. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to our guests, Echo, Alice, and Alex. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. <laughs>